Um, I'd like to thank uh, CORE and the Center for Rationality for organizing this uh, conference, or more properly, the Melt Tents Festival. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, rather than talk about completed papers that uh, don't have much to do with Melt Tents' work, I thought I'd present something that's very rough and has something to do with uh, two things that Merch Tents was interested in, stability and repeated games. Um, this is joint with Aldo Aristichini and Bob Wilson, and uh, we've been working on this off and on for a while now. More off than on, but uh, I'll just present uh, what we know and what we think is true. Um, okay, so as everybody well knows, the Fock theorem, the classical re result for repeated games, says that. Uh, Anything that's individually rational and feasible can be got as the equilibrium payoff, or even subgame perfect equilibrium payoff, uh, in a repeated game, uh, with discounting without discounting. And in particular, one implication of this is that uh, Pareto optimality is not inconsistent with strategic behavior, that you could get constrained Pareto optimal, that is, given the constraints of the Fock theorem set, you could get the Pareto frontier as equilibrium solutions. Um, that's, that's a very well-known implication, um, certainly going back to uh, work on oligopoly uh, in the 70s. Um, but another implication is that we have this huge set of equilibria, too many equilibria. And so it seems to lack a lot of predictive power. Um, so the question now is, can we use techniques from refinement to try to say something about, or try to whittle down the set, try to, to get a much smaller set uh, using some systematic theory, okay? And in particular, the question we're interested in is um, what kinds of refinements or selection criteria could be used to get to spirit optimal outcomes, okay? So, so why is this even a, why isn't this a non-starter? Why isn't this look hopeless? There's actually a lot of work in the literature that suggests that this is, uh, this has some uh, chance. So I'm going to give you an example by Allman, uh, Caves and Kutz. This is from 1976. It's not an example that many people seem to know. Uh, it's the Prisoner's Dilemma game. So, uh, it's a standard prisoner's dilemma game with cooperate and defect. Um, what I want to do is to, or what they do is say, well, let's suppose that we restrict players to use strategies of bounded recall one. Okay, so you can only use strategies that are contingent, that just depend on what your opponent did in the previous period. Okay? Ah, we get this game. And I use limit of means. Okay? So we get an eight by eight game because you get. You have to choose what to do to begin the game, and then as a function of what your opponent did, you have to choose a strategy. So you get an eight by gate game. If you do iterative elimination of dominated strategies, you get the tit for tat strategy is the only one surviving. Okay? So if you just look at this game, simple iterative elimination predicts the cooperative outcome as the only rational solution. Okay? So, um, that's the tit for tat strategy, okay? But one thing to note here is it's not, it's not that the tit for tat strategy dominates every other strategy. That's not what's happening. You really do need two steps of elimination. First, the strategy where you defect initially and then you defect when the other guy cooperates and cooperate when the other guy defects uh, eliminates the strategy where the other guy, where you do the exact opposite in the first stage. Okay? So you need this initial round of elimination, and then uh, the tit-for-tat strategy eliminates everything. Okay. Um, this is with limit of means, uh, and, and your, your, uh, your, a your action in any period can depend only on what your opponent did the previous period. But the result is somewhat robust. 
first of all, obviously, as you would as you would uh, suspect, it's also true of, with sufficiently high discounts because you just have cycles here. Uh, but it's also true if you make the recall <coughs> depend on both your strategies. If you increase recall to two, three, or four, or use automata of size two, three, or four. Okay. However, it's what is not true is that you can apply iterative elimination. You can't apply iterative elimination. So it's once you increase the memory size, uh, you don't get this uh, clean result uh, that uh, AC and K got. It's a good question. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. We don't know how to do it computationally. So this is a computational experience. This is pretty large, <laughs> computationally. Um, but the result holds in the sense that this is the only stable outcome. The cooperation is the only stable outcome in this, in this, for such small memories. It's not necessarily the tit. I mean, it's it's so it's. In the stable component, you have many stable components. It's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's not necessarily tit for tat. There is, uh, you would think that tit for tat is somehow a focal uh, strategy, if I could use the phrase, but it's not. Uh, it's not really clear. Okay. Um, that's it. not many people seem to know this, uh, as I was telling uh, Bob a uh, while back, but it is mentioned in Almansoran's paper. Uh, which is my next example. It's also, I think, in uh, Neyman's paper on automata and repeated, yeah, infinitely repeated games. I think these are the only two places where I've seen this mentioned. So. But it's a very interesting result. Okay, but that's not all. I think there are, there are other things in the literature that suggest that something like this is maybe true. Okay, so let me begin with the result by Amman and Soran in 1989. Uh, they show that if you take a common interest game, it's slightly more general, but I don't want to. Uh, I'm going to sacrifice precision to get the idea across. Supposing we have a common interest game, uh, the repeated game, and uh, we ask. And so we have, we have a small possibility that the players' uh, strategies are perturbed, and they end up playing strategies with bounded recall. They show this result that if you look at pure strategy equilibria of these perturbed games and go to the limit, um, the only equilibria that could possibly survive are the common uh, are the ones that choose the Pareto optimal outcome. Okay, and more than that, there exist such equilibria. So it's not a state; it's not a vacuous statement. There are equilibria of this form, and and the only equilibria of this uh, only pure strategy equilibria will give you Pareto optimal. Okay. Um, so, so they get they get paired optimality. Of course, you need to restrict. There are two two important restrictions here. One is you need to restrict yourself to pure strategies, pure strategy equilibria in these perturbed the games. And the other thing is that they need uh, bounded recall and uh, this discussion of why you don't you can't use bounded uh, you can't uh, use uh, automata. Okay, so you have these uh, restrictions, main restrictions. Um, There's also a result by Feudenberg and Maskin around the same time uh, that shows that if you if you uh, analyze this problem of prisoner's dilemma um, using uh, evolutionary gain theory, um, once again, and so now you restrict yourself to symmetric equilibria. Once again, you you get basically the cooperative outcome. So once you restrict yourself to symmetric equilibria, we're on the diagonal of the payoff space. Uh, there is a unique uh, Pareto optimal point on the diagonal, and that, that's the cooperative outcome. Get the same result. Uh, there, there are some conditions. Uh, they look at automata, and and there is a possibility of making mistakes in every period, and so on. So, but this is the basic message of the paper. And, and recently, I think they have uh, uh, they have extended uh, this result uh, by relaxing some of the assumptions. Um, I don't know exactly the, uh, the formal statement of the new result, but there is some extension recently as well. Um, 
similar to Oman Turan, result is a result by Demekeles, uh, which 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 uses an evolutionary viewpoint to to get the result that's similar to Oman Turan. Basically, you get the better to optimal outcome if you apply some notion of evolutionary evolutionarily stable sets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, 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 one thing is that if you, if you, when you deviate from play, um, there is a, there's somehow an obvious focal point of, uh, of the Pareto optimal outcome. So basically one of the ideas here is to use like a, the handshake argument going back to Arthur Robson. So you, you basically, s yeah. So, so that that works well in the common interest game, but it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't do anything in the prisoner's dilemma, for instance. So, um, okay. Uh, Martin Osborne and Eric Van Damme have also studied this uh, uh, idea of using refinements, but they looked at finitely repeated games, and in particular things like battle of sexes. We we know that uh, for prisoner's dilemma. Finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, you can't get anything. This is the only Nash uh, uh, outcome, so we, we can't get anything. But for battle of sexes in games like that, you can get somewhere. Uh, you can show that you couldn't repeat the same pure strategy equilibrium that's better for one of the players. You couldn't repeat the same thing twice. So on. And, and one of the, one of the, one of the one of the differences between the battle of sexes uh, and, and and say prison's dilemma and so on is in some of these games I think the finitely repeated game the asymptotic properties are are better so there are results by Benoit and Krishna about uh, folk theorems for uh, finitely repeated games so it could have something to do with that I'll say something about this later okay so um, so this is this is to this is to uh, basically uh, Give you sort of evidence from the literature that this has been sort of done. Um, yes, yes. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, that that belongs here as well. That's fine. Um, okay. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do was to. Uh, was to uh, was to was to see if there was any uh, if if this is just coincidence or if there was any any merit uh, any anything substantial that links all these results uh, um, that we could learn from, and to do that we wanted to try to systematically develop some notion of refinements for repeated games, uh, and the obvious one to fix uh, uh, sites on is stability because it's been so successful. As Bob Bauman mentioned earlier on, so that's what we intend to do. Um, so we looked at various ways of trying to attack this problem. So this this uh, presentation is a catalog of things that don't work, and uh, something that that seems to have the promise of of being able to do something. Okay, and I'll try to illustrate that by using by using a um, a version of Prisoner's Dilemma, which is sort of Stackelberg, and uh, and and getting some refinement there. Okay, but it's very it's a very limited uh, result. Uh, but, uh, anyway, you'll see. Okay, um, so uh, I, I'll just briefly talk about the model. I, I'm not going to do many many things formally, though some of this can be formalized. Um, for lack of time, I'm just going to uh, briefly. Tell you a little bit about uh, uh, about the model, and then talk a little bit about finite games because we want to know how to extend from finite games to repeated games these ideas. And uh, what we thought were there were a couple of different approaches that can be directly applied to the infinite game. And uh, th these are these are two things that don't work, at least for us, they don't. And then I'm just going to talk about a possible way to do this that may work. Okay, I'm just talk. And then this, what I call the reciprocity game, is really the Stackelberg version of the prisoner's dilemma. Okay. okay. Um, I'm just going to uh, go very quickly now. Uh, so there is a stage game, 
finite number of plays, finite number of actions, and the payoffs in the stage game. We're going to consider repeated games. Time is indexed by 0, 1, and so on. H superscript C is the set of all T period histories. And H is the union of all histories of all periods. And H infinity is going to be the set of all plays. H0 equals. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's going to be equal zero. <laughs> This may not be the only typo in the. <laughs> uh, uh, here is another one. This should be t plus one. Anyway, um, so a pure strategy specifies for. It. Yeah, but <laughs> true. But, I, but the, it's a typo because I intended to write t plus one. My hand trembled. Uh, so for every history, you, want to, you need to choose an action. Uh, so SN is a set of pure strategies. I want to look at mixed strategies. I want to deal with uh, mixed strategies because uh, for, refined, uh, for stability, you typically look at mixed strategies, not behavioral strategies. So sigma n is a set of mixed strategies. Then you have the discounted payoff, the undiscounted payoff. Uh, I'm just writing limit. It's not that it exists everywhere. but for everything that I'm going to do, this is the only thing that matters, as usual. So I'll just leave it be. And then G delta is the discounted game. Delta equals 1 is the undiscounted game. Uh, in, in refinements, we typically look at strategies, not payoffs. And in repeated games, we look at payoffs. We, don't, you know, we rarely describe things in terms of strategies. So here I'm going to look at just equilibrium payoffs for the time being. Uh, be more consistent with repeated games. V delta is the set of equilibrium payoffs for the delta game. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is to try to try to define some notion of stability for this game. Uh, to do that, I want to go back to finite games and see what we know from finite games. Okay. So this is a very quick, uh, very quick and imprecise. Uh, Reminder on what uh, what happens in finite games. Okay, so whereas notions of stability um, ask for robustness of equilibria with respect to perturbations. Okay, which means for every epsilon there is a delta such that if you're within delta in the perturbation space, then you're within epsilon of the solution we want. Okay. And uh, these are set-valued solutions, so you're within epsilon of the set of solutions, okay? So all these definitions of stability, they differ only in the notion of what counts as a perturbation. What is the space of perturbations we're dealing with? And once we have that space and have a notion of a distance there, the rest is somehow uh, standard, okay? So we could think of the space of perturbations as being the space of all perturbations of payoffs. So if I have a matrix game, if I have a two by two matrix game, then I could perturb each of the entries for the players. So my space of perturbations is just the space of all two by two games. Okay? And if you look at that, then you get this notion of essential equilibria. Okay? That's, that's, that's a concept that goes back to the 60s. So these are equilibria that are robust with respect to payoff perturbations. Now, you, if you impose if you impose an addition that, that the set be invariant under the operation of adding duplicate strategies, which means if I have a mixed strategy in the original game, and I now explicitly add it as a pure strategy. So in my original 2 by 2 game, I could mix half top, half bottom. And now I add a third strategy, which, is, which has the exact meaning of half top and half bottom, not just to the player mixing, but also for the opponent. That's what you call a duplicate strategy. And if you ask that the solution not vary if you add duplicate strategies, invariance in the appropriate sense. Because these are in different spaces. <coughs> but you can go from one to the other. If you add invariance, you get something called hyperstability. Okay. And it turns out that hyperstability is basically uh, equivalent to choosing 
components of Nash that have a non-zero fixed point index. So you can define for each component of Nash, and this is an important point because I'm going to try to do this in the infinite game. For each component of Nash, we can define a fixed point index, which is just a, uh, which just comes from fixed point theory. An index just being a count, algebraic count of the number of fixed points close by if you perturb the fixed point problem. Okay? So to say that you have a non-zero index is to say that every close by fixed point has a solution close by. Okay? Hyperstability is basically equivalent to the same guy. Okay, so, so this is one notion that we could potentially use. So. The other notion goes back to Kohlberg and Mertens, who look at a subset of the space of payoff perturbations. So if I fix delta and I fix a mixed strategy, if you want to play sigma, you will only end up playing that with probability 1 minus delta. And with probability f, uh, oops, <laughs> with probability delta, you, this is delta. With probability delta, you end up playing uh, tau. Okay. That's, a, that's another perturbation. This actually can be viewed as a very special case of payoff perturbations. Because you can say the payoff from playing sigma is the payoff from playing this. Rather than restrict the strategy set, you can change the payoffs. It's equivalent. Okay. Now that's Kohlberg Mertens, so if you use that notion. Then Mertens went on to strengthen this. I'm not going to go into this, but there's a strengthening of this that he uses. Okay, so these are the two ideas I'm gonna focus on, just uh, just to show you. Uh, how things look in, in the repeated game. So we, I'm going to look in terms of fixed point index theory, and I'm going to try to look in terms of strategy perturbations directly in the infinite game. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to this notion of hyperstability. I'm going to try to use index theory. Um, So now I want to work with discounted games. I don't want to look at delta equals one because I want to I want to look at the topological aspects of the problem. Okay. So so the mixed so the mixed strategy set is a nice uh, compact convex set. Uh, it's uh, it's even metrizable. And if you assume discounting, the payoffs are continuous. So this is why I want to look at discounting. The payoffs are continuous. The best response correspondence is well behaved. And so we can use fixed point theory. In particular, we can look at uh, notions of fixed point index and so on. And say, so you can ask the question, can we view this problem from the, from, from the viewpoint of index or fixed point theory? But, but what if we try to look at perturbations of the best of black correspondence? This is corresponds in some sense to hyperstability. Well, actually, you don't get anything. <laughs> So uh, the, way, the, way, the way it's done, the way, the way it's done uh, in applying fixed point theory is, well, we know how to do it when you have a finite dimensional space. Okay. So we know how to do fixed point uh, index theory when you have a finite dimensional space, but now you have an infinite dimensional space. How do you do it? Um, you do it by approximation using finite dimensions. Okay. So what you say is, look, I want to, the best reply correspondence is on this bigger space, but I want to try to take something that's finite dimensional and approximate everything using the finite dimensional set. Okay? So for instance, if I have a, given my opponent's strategy, I want to best respond using something in the infinite game, I'm going to take a, something that's close to it, but in this finite dimensional set, and use this as my sort of best reply correspondence. Okay, that's the perturbation. And in fact, you can do this. Okay, you can do this quite uh, explicitly. You fix epsilon greater than zero, we can find the subset of mixed strategies. A finite, you can find a finite subset of mixed strategies, and so you take a convex hull of that, those things. And you can find a map that basically approximates this. Okay, so. The new map maps from all strategies in the original game to this finite dimensional subset. And it's an approximation of the best supply correspondence in the sense that the graph 
of the best reply correspondence is within epsilon of the graph. The graph of the new best reply correspondence is within epsilon of the graph of the best reply correspondence of the original graph. Right, so it's really a finite approximation of the original problem. Okay, and really it shouldn't matter what sequences you choose typically and that those things can be shown. I'm, I'm not I don't want to bore you with many of these details, but what does it yield? Okay, the, the, very, the very tractability that uh, the discounted game gives you also causes a limitation because after uh, a million periods, really nothing matters. Okay, so for instance, these things, you know, these approximations can be things like uh, Take a large time horizon, allow for any, you know, look at the basically the t-period game up to that point, and then you just uh, fix some action beyond that point. Okay, just fix some arbitrary action beyond that point, and then you very well approximate the original problem. Okay, now, now you see this is a pretty hopeless thing because you can look at the prisoner's dilemma, and uh, you say, well, I can do anything up to period T, but beyond that point, I have to just basically do the same thing. This is like a T-period problem. And we know that we're just going to get defection forever. Okay. And in fact, you can use this to approximate any equilibrium. Okay, so trying to uh, approximate the best apply correspondence is a bit of a problem. Though, though the problem stems from the fact that uh, the approximations are not uniform in delta in some sense. Okay. How, how good these approximations are, they depend very finely on delta. So to, to borrow a term from Neyman and uh, Mertens and Neyman, we would need some kind of uniform approximation to, to get away from this problem. And, and, and maybe that's part of what we're doing, um, I think. <laughs> It's not, it's not, this is, this is not something that's, uh, <coughs> it's not something that's proved very useful for us. Um, okay, so that's, that's trying to think in terms of hyperstability. Um, so now we can try to do this in terms of, <laughs> perturbing the given repeated game towards some fixed strategy, okay? Uh, this has the flavor of Bayesian games that Francois was talking about, and so on, reputation games, in fact. Um, and, and so what happens here? So we, we, just, we just look at, uh, uh, so we're going to just look, for simplicity, we're going to look at the prisoner's dilemma, okay? So we look at prisoner's dilemma just to show you what's going on. We look at prisoner's dilemma and say, but up the game towards the tit-for-tat strategy. And now I'm going to switch focus and look at the limit of means. Uh, I'm just going to use the limit of means criterion just to make the argument uh, easier to follow. Uh, if you perturb one player, it, you can show existence, I think, but with two players, it's not. You can't show existence in general, so, but anyway, I, well, but the, my point is to actually just to do some computations and, and directly show you equilibria rather than think about existence problems here and see what kinds of problems already emerge. Uh, so tit for tat perturbation, one player is perturbed towards tit for tat. We're looking at limit of means. And I'm, I'm going to just, to, just to, just to fix ideas, uh, like in Francois's talk, I'm just going to think about one round of communication. Uh, look, look at equilibria that have the feature that there is one round of communication and then uh, no communication beyond that. What does that mean? That means in the first period, the rational type of player one, I mean the, the, the type, the tit for type, I'm just going to, that's just an automaton, but the rational type or the strategic type could possibly in the first period communicate to player two that he's rational or not. And then beyond that, there is no further revelation. Okay? I just want to focus on equilibrium of this type. There is, of course, the fully revealing equilibrium. No, I'm sorry. I should say they communicate using the strategy. The tit for tat type begins by playing cooperate. Thanks for asking the question. The tit for tat type 
begins by cooperating and then does exactly what the other, other player did in the previous round. So player one can communicate to player two in the first round by defecting. That's what I mean by communication. No discounting. I have an infinite horizon. And no discounting. No discounting. But this is a this is not a strategic type. The the the, the this 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 is this is not a this this tit for tat is. You get you get the equilibrium where. Um, you get the cooperative outcome because you know if I go defect, I yeah. For simplicity, let's look at a payoff vector of the kind where the playoffs are symmetric. Okay. When you have the commitment size, does it depend on his own payoff, or does it depend the payoff? It's just a strategy thing, right? So it's just. Yeah. Okay. You know, in the first round, so let, you know, I want. How do I get some common payoff vector less than the cooperative outcome? In the first round, player one plays defection with some probability. Okay. Following defection, because there's full revelation, we know how to get this payoff. But if player one cooperates, there is no revelation from then on. Player two plays the strategy that against tit for tat yields exactly this number. If he deviates, the rational player is going to punish him by deviating forever. If the probability of the rational type is high enough, you can sustain this as an equilibrium player. Okay. Uh, oh, you get basically the Fock theorem thing. In fact, so second reference to Corin today. The game seems to have the flavor of the game studied by Corin and Shalev. One type is an automaton. Uh, is not uh, is not really gaming this thing. Then you can construct the possible games so that uh, the strategy of the automaton you have some flexibility. So the first thing that you did uh, that are possible in foreign or shadow, so that the automaton uh, is the only possible strategy of in the constrictor. No, no, this, this epsilon type of tit for tat is fixed at the beginning. Yes. In many cases, you can construct the auxiliary game so that this is the only. And then you have, if you do that, you have a, you have a full connection. What I'm saying is that you can make a full connection with the foreign Okay. Um, so we looked at the current shallow results and we said, okay, we must get this thing. And, uh, but then we, we, we had all these other possibilities. And so uh, maybe this is all well known, but what we didn't really know much of this. So we should probably have a chat later on. But um, anyway, all I'm trying to say is that just looking at perturbations in the infinite uh, horizon game is not doing much. You, you still get the entire folk theorem set. <coughs> so I think we need to go back. So that, these are the things we learned. Just looking directly at the infinite horizon game and just technically circumventing the infinite infiniteness of the problem is not working. However, we have this startling example and other work, and there's I think they're suggesting something. They're all they all have to do with automata and things like that. So there's some finiteness that's imposed, but there must be some discipline in the way these strategies are chosen. At any point in time. Looking forward, there is some, this is this as the force of disciplining your beliefs about what's happening. So we just want to look at bounded recall or bounded uh, or, or finite, uh, finite automata and study those games. Okay. So an obvious thing, so let's just look at two-player games. An obvious thing to do is to just look at automata. Okay. So then the question is, what kinds of automata? We're going to fix the size of the automata for each player. Um, in principle, we can look at what we're going to call normal form automata. So these are just deterministic 
deterministic transitions and deterministic actions. But you could also have randomized actions. You could also have randomized transitions. Let me not go there for the time being. Let me just say that the transitions are deterministic, but the actions are random. I'm going to call them the behavioral form. Uh, okay, but they're all, you know, so they, they, both, they both induce finite games. And they all have uh, good properties. The behavioral form is especially nice because if you know that your opponent is using a behavioral strategy of size kn, then you have a best response of size kn. Uh, just use his states as your states for the automaton, and then, and then you can do this. It's not true when your opponent is mixing over pure automaton. You can't, you can't do this. Uh, on the other hand, you know, so on the other hand, the pure automata, you got linearity of payoffs, uh, which you don't have for behavioral forms. So they all seem to have one, one advantage or the other. However, both of them have the following problem. It's impossible to think about these strategies in the infinite game without losing perfect recall. Uh, you just, uh, if I think of choosing an automaton, I just choose it once and for all in the beginning. I have no, I cannot revise my strategy. Uh, the, re the representation is just, everything is automated, right? So there's no way to think about this dynamically. It's not, it's not possible to think about the dynamic representation of an automaton. And yet, for refinements, especially things like stability, a lot of the power comes from the counterfactual reasoning you do off the equilibrium part. If, ma if the... <coughs> If a player deviates from equilibrium play, what am I going to infer about what he's doing? This reasoning is not possible uh, if you don't have perfect recall. In fact, it's even worse, as I'll show you. We have a game. You could start with a stage game that's perfect information, and you convert it to a game with you know you don't have perfect recall. Okay, so that's that doesn't seem like a nice thing. So what we want to do is to try to get the flavor of automata and yet be able to have perfect recall. And in fact, if you have a game with perfect information, produce a game that has perfect information. Okay. Uh, which then leads us to our definition. Okay, that's the that's a technical definition. I think you can ignore this and maybe just listen to what I have to say because it's simpler in words. Um, so if you have a two-player game, and supposing each player has atom can use an automata of size 10, what we want to do is to look at all pairs of automata for the two players, one for each player, and look at the path of play induced by each such pair. And so take all these uh, paths, and then we prune the tree so no other path exists. Okay, and that's what we are talking about in terms of selections here. The definition of a selection is much more general. A selection is basically a finite selection of plays from the tree. Okay, it just needs to satisfy an additional property that it respects the information structure of the original game. So if I have a simultaneous move game, stage game, uh, in each stage that information structure should be respected. Okay, so that's uh, uh, that's a condition, that's a technical condition. But basically all it says is you look at finite plays of the game, of the infinite game, and that's what counts as a selection. In particular, we're looking at selection generated by automata of given size or bounded recall of given length and so on. That's what this is definition is saying. Okay. So it's a finite game. I want to stress here that it's not, it's not a finite stage game. So I'm not going up to T periods and then stopping. The play continues forever, but after some point, no player has any non-trivial move to make at any point in time. Okay? And by looking at things like automata, I get that delta equals one is a point of continuity of this game. Right, so what I want to I want to look I want I want to have delta equals one be a point of continuity of the analysis. And things like automata seem to do this properly. Okay. Um, 
in general, I guess, anytime you have a, you have a, anytime you have the discounted average converging, that would be good enough. But there is the, the strategic considerations seem different. Okay, so I want to take a finite selection, which is this pruned, finitely pruned tree obtained from the original game. It defines a finite game, and I can now look at its equilibria. Okay, so I want to think about approximations of these things. So basically, the prune tree is getting denser as the approximation gets finer until I get the whole thing. Hausdorff on plays or something like that. But I also want to replicate the Fock theorem set as I increase my gain. Okay, so I want to be. So I want to, I want, this is, this is crucial here because I want to, I want to look at a finite selection where the equilibrium payoffs are approximately the Fock theorem set. And from this set, I would like to be able to make a selection. So that's the thing we want to study. Uh, and so we want, we want to, everything would depend on the approximating sequence. And this says, a subset of payoffs is stable. I'm just focusing on payoffs. We should probably talk about strategies. But a subset is stable if there is an approximating sequence of games and then a corresponding sequence of stable sets whose payoffs converge to this. So we believe that this is the formulation that we sort of need. And we have some experience suggesting that this is what's going on. There's something about selections induced by automata that seem to work well. And this goes back to this notion of sort of uniform approximation of vestal plug correspondence I told you about. Uh, it's, it seems to be a defining property of, of selections induced by automata. <laughs> okay, I'll just end with a, with a simple example here. This is the Stackelberg version of uh, Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, B is greater than C. Okay, I've just called this a reciprocity game. It can be viewed like a lender-borrower game. I lend today, I, I lend today, you borrow, and then you repay me tomorrow, something like that. Or mutual gift giving. This is Pareto optimal, but this is what's going to happen. B is greater than C. This is Pareto optimal, but this is what's going to happen. Um, if the ratio is, of B to C is generic, then finite selections have a unique subgame perfect equilibrium. And this is not defect forever. OK. Uh, this, this, if, I, if I take a finite selection of this, if I repeat this finitely many times, of course, you get this. But if I take a finite selection, depending on the selection, of course, but if I take selections induced by automata, you don't get this. It's a unique subgame perfect equilibrium. Okay, if the ratio of the ratio of complexities goes to zero, it's stronger than that. Uh, you get a result that uh, Dov and uh, Gilboa got, which is which they call the twenty of the week. Basically, the player whose complexity is limited gets his gets his best possible payoff. <coughs> okay, now if the ratio is is the same and if the equilibrium is symmetric, we get the cooperative outcome. I would think, but it's. it's we're not sure how to prove that this is symmetric. And it seems as the ratio of this goes from 0 to infinity, we somehow seem to trace better optimal paths. At least uh, this ratio has to go to 0 sufficiently fast. You know, so for small memories, even if it's asymmetric, it doesn't matter too much. Yeah. You mean that k2 is much larger than k1. So k1 is little of k2. One is long memory, and yeah. Basically, you, you can, uh, basically, the problem is that player two can separate player one from the strategy that gives him the best payoff, because he has such a long memory. And, uh, and you separate, and you best respond separately. And uh, so player one, who's committed, has the best payoff, actually. It's kind of, uh, it's very seems counterintuitive until you think about it, and then, and then you see that this is uh, 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 So I, I, think, uh, I think I'm all out of time. So uh, I think I will just uh, stop here, yeah, the questions. So.
what is for? For, I, I, for the day of, for, uh, death of occurring. Yeah. Which, uh, you mean one of the guys? If, if, uh, if the payoffs for the death can operate be like 7 0, instead of 4 0, then it cooperates. I want to, I want to look at the, uh, I want to, in the folk theorem set, I want to look at the Pareto frontier. Yeah, okay, so the Pareto frontier, the line connecting between 7 and 7 is about 3 2. Right, right, the cooperate, cooperate, and the uh, this one? Yeah. So if you change the numbers to 4 to 7, the prediction would be 6. You know, you what I'm saying is you don't get 6C. You don't get 6C. You get 6C, uh, uh, half of DC, perhaps. Plus half of CD. Half? That the dominates this. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. But I don't, I don't understand, like, why, what you're telling us to change if I change these numbers. In this analysis, I haven't looked into it. I, I don't know. So I, it's I, like, would protect it from injury? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You mean the game with this epsilon automata? Yeah. That's what I, I couldn't. I, I was just trying I was just trying to show what you could get. You get lots of equilibria. That was the only thing I wanted to say here. I, I had no, nothing more to say on this. Well, I think he's asking uh, about the Hellman case uh, uh, curve. That I don't know. Interesting question. I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, good right, question. I don't know. You won't get it. No. I don't know what you get. I don't think you'll get this pattern. Depend on the numbers. I mean, this makes a big difference. Yes, yeah. when you when you make C, CC no longer Pareto optimal, yeah. Yeah, then then you're making a big quantitative difference. In the game. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, why do you think that all this will lead to Pareto optimal? I mean, what's your what's your basic question? Where does it come from? Um, I think that uh, when when the players. Uh, I don't know. What we want to know is different selections induce different equilibria. So we were just looking at the selections that lead to Pareto optimality. The basic idea is that with things like uh, bounded uh, uh, recall or automata, uh, there is this initial phase where it's really cheap talk, you're not doing anything, but there is this phase where you're communicating and trying to get a good outcome for yourself. And then there is this final phase where you're sort of in a survival mode where so it would seem reasonable that you would not get into a thing that's just mutually destructive. It's not it's, it's not clear. Hello? Yeah. Uh, in the paper with Saran, you perturb by uh, not, not by boundary call automata, but by automata, you don't get the result. You know, even yeah. in common interest games, you don't get the result. So I, I think, uh, um, are you hoping for a result with general automata over here, or, or with, of course that's different, you're not perturbing, yeah? Yes. You're not well, perturbing. I understand, but yeah, I, I saw the second uh, Sergio's question that it seems to be a pious hope that you look for uh, for uh, uh, for greater optimal stuff. Uh, uh, is there any? Do you have some intuition that that indicates or? or this is just a prayer, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, the original thing was to study what selections lead to what outcomes, just to try to get a handle on this. 
and to see if, in particular, what selections lead to the optimal outcomes. You have some, some intuition why it should lead to Pareto optimal. It really depends on these forward induction kind of stories. That's, uh, that's the only answer I have. So. I don't know. It's a finite selection, so it's a finite game, but I don't know what the asymptotic properties are. Okay. Well, that's where it should be because it's not. That's the way.